Hi everyone, I'm Andy Neal and this is a Motion 5 Quick Tip. Technically this is also a Final Cut Pro 10 Quick Tip since these two applications are now more closely connected than ever before. And it's never been more apparent than now than when you can actually use Motion 5 to create effects to use inside Final Cut. I'm going to give you a primer on how it's done by creating a custom picture-in-picture -picture effect. Starting here at the open screen for Motion, you can see that you have many project types to choose from now. The basic Motion project, and also titles, generators, transitions, and effects. Since picture-in-picture -picture is something that I'll be applying to a clip rather than being added as its own track or own clip, I'm going to choose the Final Cut Effect project. In the upper right, you can choose the preset frame size that you want to work in. I'm using Broadcast HD 720 preset. This is just my own preference as I like to work in HD and in 16x9, but you'll be able to apply this effect to any sort of footage, standard def or high def. Also, the duration doesn't have a, a whole lot of bearing either. It has some, but we'll go over that later. In general, you don't have to worry about the duration because the effect will be stretched automatically to fit the length of the clip that it's being applied to. Hit open to start the project. First thing that you can see is that Motion has already placed a drop zone in your project with the name Effect Source. This drop zone is a reference for the clip that you will be applying this effect to. What this means is that anything you do to this layer will appear on the affected clip inside Final Cut. It's pretty straightforward. To make a custom mask in Motion, you need to use the Bezier Mask tool. Make sure the Effect Source clip is selected then click and hold on the mask button to reveal all the options, choosing Bezier Mask. Click in the viewer and start drawing your mask however you want it to look. I'm going to go for something that looks a little like a slight four-pointed star, but you can make it look whatever you want. It's up to you. Just make sure that it doesn't extend all the way to the edges of the frame. You may also want to give yourself some room from the edges too in case you want to allow for feathering of the mask. Once you've finished, you should only see the effect source in the shape of your mask. Now you could be done right here. You could save this effect and drop it onto clips inside Final Cut 10 without another step. But if you want to give yourself some flexibility and make this into an effect that you can use over and over again, then there are a few more steps that we should try. There's a new feature inside Motion 5 called Publishing. What Publishing gives you is access to motion parameters from within Final Cut. And publishing a parameter is very easy. For example, I may want to feather the edges of my mask. Go to the Mask tab of the inspector and there you'll see a feather parameter. I can assign it a value now, but then it'll just be a set value inside Final Cut and I'll have to come back to this project every time I want to change it. Instead, click on this downward facing arrow. This is the animation menu for this parameter and choose Publish from the list. Outwardly, nothing has happened, but click on the layer marked Project. This contains all of your project settings. In the Project tab, you can see your published parameters. Here is the feather control that we just published. If I adjust the slider, you can see feathering being applied just the same as if I had adjusted it at the point of the original control. Anything that is in the Published Parameter section will be visible inside Final Cut's Inspector. So let's add a few more parameters. Anything else that I think I might want control over inside Final Cut 10. Go back to the Bezier mask layer. Let's publish the parameter for roundness and for falloff, common parameters for adjusting masks. Go back to the project settings to see the new parameters that are there. Not only will these properties be visible inside Final Cut, but however they look here will be their default setting when they're applied. In other words, if we want the roundness control to be at the top of our list of parameters, we can rearrange it here by simply dragging it above the feather control. You can also rename the controls if you want by double clicking the name. Do this for the roundness control and call it adjust mask. Just for giggles. Now let's save our project. When you create an effect project instead of a normal motion project, motion assumes that you want to save it to be available in Final Cut so you don't get the normal dialog box. Give your effect a name. I'm calling mine Adjustable PIP. In the Category section, you need to choose or create a category in which to save the effect. If you've never made an effect before, you'll only have the choice to create a new category. 
I created one before called Custom, and this is where I put all of my custom effects. You can also create a theme if you want. Themes are groups of effects that have an overall look to them. You can browse the various themes that come with Final Cut 10 in the Effects Browser if you want to take a look at them. While categories are required, a theme isn't, so just uncheck the button that says Include Unused Media and hit Publish. Now we can head back over to Final Cut. Here I have two clips, one atop the other. Open your Effects Browser if it's not already open and find the category you created in Motion. Inside, you should see your effect. Drag it onto the top clip. Scrubbing over the two clips, you can see that it's already working. Open the inspector if it isn't already, and inside the video section are the published parameters for your effect. As you can see, I can adjust the mask right here. Click on the transform icon in the viewer in order to adjust the scale of the picture-in-picture -picture clip so that it's much smaller than the background. And there we have our basic effect, built in motion and applied in Final Cut. But now that we've tried it out, there are many things that could be made better with it. For one, I can't adjust the image behind the mask, so the mask is cutting off the head of the leopard. Also, it just pops on and off, and it would be nicer if I could add in a fade to that effect. Well, okay, let's go attend to that. Flip over to motion. We still have our effect project open. To be able to move and reposition the affected video layer behind the mask, it has to be separate from the mask. Right now, the mask is directly affecting the layer, so to fix that, drag the Bezier mask layer onto the group instead. Outwardly, there's no difference, but now that the effect source layer is by itself, I can move it independent of the mask. And if I can do that in motion, then I can do it in Final Cut by publishing the right parameters. Go to the Properties tab for the Effect Source layer. Click on the Animation menu for the position and publish it. Do the same for the Scale parameter as well. Click on the Project Settings and go to the Project tab to see your published parameters. Rename the Position parameter to Video Position and the Scale to Video Scale. This is so that there is no confusion in Final Cut about what these parameters affect. Next thing I wanted to do was to add the ability to do a fade in and out. Well, creating a fade in motion is easy. Just select the group and go to Behaviors, Basic Motion, Fade In, Out. This gives us a fade that we can adjust in the Behaviors tab. But it also leads us to our first real problem regarding our effect. You see, in the Behaviors tab, I can adjust the fade in or out to any number that I want. There's no real limit. But, if I just publish this parameter as is, it could lead to a problem inside Final Cut. And here's why. Remember when I said not to worry about the duration of your motion project because it would automatically be lengthened or shortened to fit the clip inside Final Cut? Well, I said that because we didn't have any animated elements in our effect at first. Final Cut stretches the length of the motion project to fit the clip it's applied to. Our project duration is 10 seconds, or 300 frames. If we apply that effect to a 20 second clip inside Final Cut, any animation that exists in our motion project will run at half speed, because our 300 frames are being stretched to 600 frames. The reverse would also happen if we applied a clip shorter than 10 seconds. The animation would speed up. In other words, our 20 frame fade in will never actually be 20 frames, unless the effect is applied to a clip that's the exact same length as our project. Luckily, Motion has an answer for this. They're called mandatory build markers. Open the timing pane of your project by hitting F6. Make sure that no layer is selected. Just click an empty space in the timing pane or in the layers pane. Drag anywhere in the timeline and hit M to place a marker. Drag further down and hit M again to place a second marker. Right-click the first marker and choose Edit. At the bottom, click the Type drop-down to reveal the marker types. Choose Build-in Mandatory. A mandatory build-in marker states that any part of the project prior to this point will always play using the exact number of frames that Motion uses, no matter how stretched or squashed the effect is inside Final Cut. 
A mandatory build out marker does the same for ending animations. Select the second marker and change it to mandatory build out. Note the change in the look of the markers. There is now a highlighted area between them. Think of this area as the area where no animation occurs, or the place where Final Cut can stretch the effect without there being a noticeable difference. The placement of the markers doesn't really matter so long as the animation of the fade behavior doesn't cross it. This means that we need to restrict the amount of fade that we plan to allow with our effect. And that brings us to one of the other cool new aspects of Motion 5, rigging. Rigging is a way to create our own controllers for motion effects. Rigs can be incredibly complex and they can involve literally hundreds of parameters adjusted with a single control. But rigs can also be very simple and we're going to create a simple rig. Go to the object menu and choose new rig from the menu. In the inspector you'll see buttons for the three types of controllers you can choose from. These are called widgets. There is the slider, the pop-up, and the checkbox. Click the slider button to create a slider widget. To rename the slider, click the word in the layers pane and type fade in. This slider will represent the fade in control of our effect. Again, the reason we're not just publishing the fade in parameter from the behavior is that you can add any value you want with it and there's no way to restrict it. But we need it to be restricted for our purposes. This is one of the many ways that an effect can influence its own design. If you look at the slider widget controls, they're fairly simple to understand. There is a dot on the left side which represents the slider's lowest value and a dot on the right side which represents its highest value. And we can set and record these arbitrarily. Below the slider is a range minimum and maximum. For the minimum, I think zero is fine in case I don't actually want to add a fade in. For the maximum, let's say four seconds. That's probably the biggest fade I'm going to need for this effect. That's 120 frames. So change the maximum range value to 120. If I slide the slider, you'll see that the value goes from 0 to 120. Now, to set it as a fade in, we need to record its highest and lowest values. Select the left dot below the slider and click the start button. Now, we are in record mode. Any changes that we make to the project will be recorded as a relative value associated with this slider position. This mini HUD lets us know that we're recording. In a lot of ways, rigging is like making a macro, or like making an action in Photoshop if you've ever done that. Select the fade behavior. Drag the fade in slider to zero. Click stop on the mini HUD. Note that there is now a little joystick icon beside the parameter that we changed. This is an indicator to let you know that this parameter is under the control of a widget. It doesn't tell you which widget is controlling it, but if you click the animation menu, you can choose Reveal Widget from the list and Motion will jump you to the correct controller. As you can see, the parameter we adjusted is now showing up below the controls for the slider. Now we need to set the upper limit for our fade. Because we're only adjusting a single parameter and it's already been connected to the widget, I don't need to hit the start button again to change its value. Just make sure that the right dot is selected and adjust the fade in parameter to 120 to match the maximum range that we set for our widget. Now, if you drag the widget slider, you will see the fade in parameter match it exactly. We need to do the same thing for the fade out parameter. Create another slider widget by selecting the rig and then clicking the slider button. Rename this slider fade out. Click the left dot and hit start to enter edit mode. Go to the behavior and in the behaviors tab, drag the fade out slider to zero. Click stop and go back to the widget controls. Click the right dot and adjust the fade out value to 120. Don't forget to also set the maximum range to 120 just like we did with the fade in slider. There. We've just created two custom controllers. Simple, true, but they're custom. In order to see them in Final Cut, however, we're going to need to publish them. Click the animation menu and publish each widget. Go to the publishing section of the project settings and rearrange the sliders if you want. I'm just going to put the fade in before the fade out. One last thing I need to do is to make sure that my markers are not inside the 120 frame maximum fade that I'm allowing for the effect. If yours are, just drag the markers to reposition them. 
Like I said, it doesn't really matter where they go so long as they're excluding the animations. Now that we've finished adjusting our effect, just hit save and it will update inside Final Cut. Flip over to Final Cut. One thing to keep in mind, any effects that have already been applied to clips in your timeline will not have the updated controls. I think this is a way to protect any effects that you've already added from changes that you may or may not have made to the overall effect. To take advantage of our work, we need to delete the picture-in-picture -picture effect and re-add it. There, now we have all of our additional controls. I can adjust the mask, I can feather it as before, but now I can also scale the video up and I can uh, reposition it to get the perfect picture-in-picture -picture effect. And that's all there is to it, to creating your own custom effects inside Final Cut. I think if I wanted to add more to this effect, I might publish the drop shadow properties. I could also create an edge border with controls. Or maybe I'd just create a new effect for that. After all, one of the most important things to grasp when you're designing effects is not what controls you put in, but what controls you leave out. I'm Andy Neal, and this has been a Motion and Final Cut Pro Quick Tip.